Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the European Information Days of the Live Program Edition 2024. Today is the fourth and last day of this event that uh, we have organized here at CINEA in order to inform you about the different calls for proposals that are available now uh, for future applicants for life funding. And uh, you can find all the calls for proposals in the funding and tender opportunities uh, portal of the European Commission. So please uh, don't hesitate to go and look for the most relevant call for proposals that would uh, fit your, uh, your proposal, your project. However, today we are not going to talk about uh, uh, grants for projects, action grants that was already uh, presented uh, in the past days. We're going to talk about calls for proposals for life operating grants, which are um, special grants that um, uh, don't uh, fund projects, but fund rather the work program of uh, organizations, NGOs, uh, non-profit making entities, which contribute to both the policy uh, development and the policy implementation of uh, policies in the field of environment, climate, clean energy transition, nature and biodiversity. So uh, we uh, see we, we have a lot of participants today. We welcome you. And we remind you that you can uh, participate uh, to this webinar uh, by connecting through Slido. So please uh, do not hesitate to type slido.com. And then once you're in Slido, Hashtag, hashtag EU Life 24, all in capital letters. There you will be able to ask your questions. But before you ask questions, please listen carefully to our presentations because uh, we, there will be a lot of insights, uh, a lot of uh, policy uh, updates from uh, the Commission, but also a lot of uh, explanations on how to apply and uh, the, the application and the evaluation processes. So uh, please uh, bear with us. And once you are uh, at the question and answer session, you can also like the questions that have already been posted. And a question that has more likes is more likely to be treated in priority. So there will be plenty of time for questions and answers uh, at the end of the morning. So uh, we will start today. Can I have the agenda, please? We will uh, uh, first uh, give you some, uh, well, not, not we as CINEA, but our guests from the Commission, uh, DG Environment, DG Climate, and DG Energy, will give us some policy updates uh, that are relevant uh, to the NGO grants. And then uh, we will uh, uh, give you a presentation on uh, operating grants calls and uh, how to apply and uh, what is the selection procedure like. And then there will be also a presentation uh, more specific on the financial aspects of, uh, of a proposal. So um, before we start uh, with this agenda, I would first like to give the floor to uh, my colleague Anne Burrell who is uh, head of unit uh, life environment in CINEA. And uh, she would uh, just like to give us uh, a welcome message. Uh, and please join us. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, indeed, welcome to this session. It's a session about a special type of grant for certain types of NGOs, the NGO operating grants. Um, of course, as it's been mentioned over the previous days, this is not the only kind of grant that NGOs can apply to. In fact, NGOs normally make up about a third of the participants in our standard action grants. So if what you're actually looking for is a grant for a project, then you should be applying to a SAP call, either with or without partners. Um, but what we are talking about here instead is the operating grants. Um, these are grants that support the overall work program of certain NGOs and NGO networks. They have to be ones that work at the European level and which are involved in the development, implementation and enforcement of union legislation and policy. And of course, which are primarily active in the areas of environment or climate, including energy transition. We know that NGOs are important actors in environmental and climate governance and this is the reason that the LIFE regulation foresees this type of grant. 
the specific type of support to enhance the involvement of civil society in such governance. It's a support for the development, implementation, monitoring, and enforcement of the relevant union legislation and policy. So as Eva mentioned, operating grants are not to support projects per se, but rather to support the operations of the relevant NGOs. And these are NGOs that will meet specific criteria that are gonna be set out by my colleagues later today. I stress this because the eligibility criteria of the operating grant calls are rather strict. So applicants should check carefully before submitting an application to avoid any disappointment. Having said that, I'd note that the NGO operating grants are not something new. And as many of you will know, they've been in existence for many years now. Um, Perhaps the most important specific thing to mention with this year's call, and as it will be explained in more detail afterwards by my colleagues, there are actually two procedures running in parallel. Um, we hope this by the end of today, that will not be confusing to anyone. Um, but today we have two things. First, we have the 2024 Framework Partnership Agreement call. This will lead to Framework Partnership Agreements, FPAs, for two years. The organizations with which we sign FPAs are then eligible to be considered for specific grant agreements under the 2024 Specific Grant Agreement call. That will finance activities for the 2025 fiscal year. They will also, the ones who sign the FPAs under this FPA call, will be eligible to be considered for SGAs under the 2025 call, which will finance the activities for the 2026 fiscal year. So the FPA call covers two years, but for reasons of timing, we need to run the 2024 SGA call in parallel. So any applicants need to actually submit two applications, both to the FBA call and to the SGA call. The SGA application will only be considered if you are approved under the FBA call. So we've seen also, I mean, I've tell, told you what we're doing now under this two-year framework. We've seen there've been a lot of requests under other questions to say what will be the continuation in future years. It's too early to confirm this information because um, calls after this year will be under the context of the LIFE 2025 to 2027 multi-annual work program, and that's still being developed. However, I can say tentatively, our expectation at the present is that we'll, we will be running another call for FPAs in 2026. And that will set the framework for the specific grant agreements that will cover the fiscal years 2027 and 2028. I hope that's not too confusing and I think it will be repeated by my colleagues afterwards. Um, but to set out, we this year we're running an FBA call for two years. We expect if the future multi-annual work program allows it that we will run another FPA call, FPA call in 2026. And well, after that, um, it depends whether the LIFE program's renewed under the next multi-annual financial framework. So I can't say anything beyond that time frame. But for the moment today, what we're concentrating on is, is the present call. And my Sinea colleagues are gonna be describing it in more detail to you. Um, first, however, I'll hand back to Eva, our moderator, who's going to present the representatives from the Commission Services, who will give you the policy context in which these NGO operating grants will be um, implemented. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Anne, for your introductory words and uh, also for explaining the mechanics of this uh, calls for proposals. Yeah, we will try to uh, explain it more into detail later on. But first, I would like to invite uh, our first guest from uh, DG Environment of the European Commission, Clara Hirschman, who uh, is a policy officer in DG Environment and will uh, give us uh, um, a quick uh, overview of the latest policy updates and uh, initiatives from the Commission, where I, I suppose uh, we, uh, well, the Commission would like to focus in the, in the coming years. 
So Clara, please uh, turn on your camera and mic and uh, start your presentation. Thanks a lot for this nice introduction. Um, so I'm very happy to be here from DJ Environment. I'm very, working on the live unit um, and now I will present to you the, the recent policy updates in the environmental policy area. Um, and as you all know, we had a very um, ambitious EU agenda in the last years with the European Green Deal and several strategies and action plans were adopted. So we had, for example, the biodiversity strategy, the circular economy action plan, the zero pollution action plan, the chemical strategy for sustainability, um, the EU forestry strategy, the farm to fork strategy and the environmental action program. This week, um, the Commission adopted a communication on the essential uses of chemicals. But besides these uh, many legislative proposals, uh, no, besides this, we had, of course, also many legislative proposals and many adoptions. And that's what I will focus now on um, in, in the most important um, agreements and implementations since um, 2023. So you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So um, I see there's a small issue with the presentation, but I think it will be clear in the um, when I say it. So we, first of all, in 2023, um, we had uh, the adoption uh, of the regulation on batteries and it also entered into force. So um, batteries, as you know, are very important for the future. The um, demand is um, increasing rapidly um, and that's why it's also a good step forward that we have now legislation here. Um, and specifically, now this is the first piece of EU legislation where we have a full life cycle approach in which sourcing, manufacturing, use and recycling are addressed in one specific law. So the regulation will restrict the hazardous substances in batteries, um, which will also um, ensure that they do not pose any unacceptable risk to human health and the environment. There are also specific targets set for producers to collect waste batteries, um, and it also introduces dedicated collection objectives for waste batteries for light means of transport, which are 51% by the end of 2028 and 61% by the end of two the, um, 2031. Um, and there's also a, set a target for, lith for lithium recovery from waste batteries of 50% by the, the end of 2027. Um, so generally, I think this is a very important piece of legislation for the recycling of batteries and so also for the circular economy. Then we also had uh, um, the adoption of the and the entering into force of the regulation for deforestation free supply chains in June 2023. Um, this, um, this prescribes our mandatory due diligence rules for operators which place specific products on the EU market. And these are soy, beef, palm oil, palm oil, wood, cocoa, coffee, and some derived products like leather, chocolate, and furniture. And all these commodities have to um, be produced in accordance with the laws of the country, uh, country of production. And operators which will place these on the um, EU market will have to collect the geographical coordinates of the place where they were produced. Then also, um, still in 2023, um, we had an, a political agreement um, on the eco design for sustainable products regulation. I will not go into detail on this because I know my um, colleague from DGN will go more into detail. Um, but just to, to say um, it's a very important um, new legislation because it will ensure that many appliances put on the EU market will be more durable. Uh, more reusable, upgradable, and recyclable, so the duration and lifetime of um, appliances will be prolonged. Then now, next slide. Now I already come to 2024. Yeah, so now this um, there were, was already quite some advancement this year. Um, so the first one I want to present is the waste shipment regulation, which was adopted. Um, this one will um, will prohibit um, exports of plastic waste from EU to non-OECD countries. Um, other waste, which is suitable for recycling, can be exported from the EU to non-EU countries only when these are when they can ensure that they can deal with it in a sustainable uh, manner. So generally, um, and besides this, the, um, the rules for um, shipments of waste between member states will be uh, modernized and there are now new measures to, to better tackle illegal waste shipments. This regulation will enter into force um, within two years after, after the entry into force. 
will start apply two years after the entry into force. Um, then we also um, have a new directive on the protection for the environment through criminal law, which was adopted this March. Um, this will improve the EU-wide investigation and prosecution of environmental crimes, and it establishes an EU-wide minimum rules on the definition of criminal offenses and penalties. Um, so some breaches of environmental obligation now will be uh, treated as criminal offenses in all EU member states. For example, illegal trade and handling of chemicals or mercury or illegal ship recycling. And there will be similar types or, uh, and levels of sanctions for natural and legal persons across the EU member states. And this will en ensure consistent application and also enhance the deterrence effect. Then we also, um, the directive on industrial emissions was adopted in April. Um, this um, will limit more effectively the pollution um, from industrial installations. And these new rules will also um, better protect um, human health and the environment by reducing ha harmful emissions from industrial installations. Um, they will also promote more energy efficiency, a circular economy and decarbonization. Um, then also in March 2024, we had um, the, like the critical raw materials was adopted. Um, this is very important for circular economy, but as well, of course, for the um, ambitious European industrial policy. So in these new rules, um, we aim to increase and to diversify the EU's um, critical raw material supply uh, and to strength strengthen circularity also through the recycling. And we also will support research and innovation on resource efficiency and um, the development of um, substitutes. And as a fixed objective, by 2023, uh, 2030, 25% of the use annual consumption of critical raw materials should be recycled. So this is also important, of course, to reinforce the circular economy. Then I want to add one point, which is not on the slides, um, but in February, we also um, had a, the directive empowering consumers for the green transition um, was adopted. This is um, mainly, to, as I already said in the name, it's to empower consumers. Uh, against misleading green claims. So for example, um, we have we see often something on products like environmentally friendly, climate friendly, eco-friendly, and these, um, these kind of generic uh, environmental claims um, will be banned if they're not substantiated. And there will also be stricter rules on the use of um, sustainability labels. Um, either they will have to be established by, by a public authority or they will have to be based on the EU eco label. So then we also had some political agreements. Um, so where there the adoption of council and parliament um, is like is still ongoing, but at least we have a political agreement. So we assume they will be adopted soon. Um, we have the um, regulation on packaging and packaging waste. Uh, this is also super important for the uh, reducing packaging and um, reducing waste mainly. Um, so it really aims at, uh, um, at trying, trying to reduce the packaging waste in the EU and to move more to a circular economy. So there will be um, just restrictions for the placing on the EU market of food contact packaging, which contains certain substances, like, for example, the PFAS. Um, there are some headline targets for 2030 and 2040 for minimum recycled content. Um, also, in packaging, the maximum empty space ratio will be limited to 50%. So this will reduce packaging and will also um, minimize the weight and the volume of packaging. And um, takeaway businesses um, will have to offer customers the possibility to bring their own containers to, um, to refill them. Um, yes, and in by 2030, all takeaway activities must aim to offer 10% um, of products in packaging formats, which can be reused. Um, and also a part of this, um, in, by 2029, member states may have to ensure that uh, a separate collection of at least 90% of uh, single-use plastic bottles and need to put up a deposit return system. Um, and then there are some additional um, provisions in it. Um, for example, the plastic um, packaging for fruits and vegetables should be restricted. Um, 
Now, another provisional agreement uh, is on the revised rules for ambient air quality, um, the AIN directive. This is a very important initiative for the zero pollution action plan and for the objecting to um, for zero pollution of air, water and soil by 2050. So these um, new directives will introduce and set new EU air quality standards, which are more closely aligned with the WHO global air quality guidelines. There will be um, specific um, standards and um, limit values for, um, for substances, also including fine particles and particular matter. And also very important, there will be improved um, access to justice and right for compensation um, if um, someone is affected by a, like a not sufficient implementation of these new rules. And uh, citizens can are entitled to a claim and obtain um, compensation where there are damages to their health um, due to um, um, a negligent uh, or intentional violation of the national rules. Um, then we also had a provisional agreement on um, the proposal revising the Open Wastewater Treatment Directive. This is also important to um, 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 strengthen the protection of human health and um, the environment from harmful discharges of urban wastewater. Um, now the um, context where it applies is broader because it will apply um, to also cover smaller agglomerations starting from 1,000 inhabitants. Um, and also the wastewater sector will have to become more energy efficient. Um, there was increased access to sanitation in public spaces. Uh, and uh, there's also a, um, a requirement to remove um, more nutrients and microplastics from urban wastewater. And additionally, there will be uh, introduced a systematic monitoring system for microplastics with, with the objective to really um, gather more knowledge on this area, which of course also is more and more um, urgent. So in total, this will lead to cleaner rivers, cleaner lakes, cleaner groundwater and seas all over Europe. Um, then um, we also have a provisional agreement on the right to repair directive. And there also this um, Tuesday, the parliament um, voted on this. So now it's, uh, there's still a vote outstanding in the council. Um, and this will also reinforce the, the, the consumers and have also increased the possibilities to uh, get items repaired um, already beyond the legal guarantee deadline. So um, when the legal guarantee has expired, the QS consumer will be able to request an easier and cheaper repair of defects. Um, and these products also have to be um, technically repairable. So for example, tablets, smartphones, washing machines, dishwashers, and the manufacturer will also be required to publish information about their repair services. Additionally, manufacturers will be prohibited to use um, any uh, means to, um, to put up barriers to repairing their, their items, for example, contractual hardware or software. Um, so this will really be a step forward to, to also ensure the durability of items and repairability. Now we, and we still have some outstanding issues. So last slide, please. You might all um, follow also the news on the nature restoration law. So on the nature restoration law, nature restoration law we, um, we don't have a final adoption yet. Currently there's no vote in the council um, because there's at the moment no majority in the council. But um, I mean, it's um, the stays on the table. Then we also have a proposal for a soil monitoring law, um, um, which was uh, proposed July last year. Um, and there the trialogues did not start yet. And this should um, protect and uh, uh, substantiate um, the protection and the, the management of EU forests. Um, we also have a proposal for a forest monitoring framework for resilient European forests. Um, which was also proposed end of last year and should really increase the um, knowledge base on forests and also um, respond to growing pressures on forests and strengthen their resilience. Um, but this is also still in the beginning of the legislative process. Um, and additionally, we have a proposal substantiating environmental claims, which will um, be complementary to the, the directive um, on empowering consumers for the green transition, which was already adopted, 
um, um, and that's really reinforce the scientific um, evidence which will be necessary for certain environmental claims. We still have some other um, proposals, let's say, um, in the pipeline, but I will now not go on to all the detail, but it's possible that these proposals, um, a part of them are still adopted in the current uh, mandate, but they also might be go to, to the next mandate. And there I come to my last point. So in June, of course, we come to the um, EU elections. So that means we are in a transition year um, and we are looking ahead of the upcoming period. Um, it's very clear that the, we have the ambitions of the European Green Deal firmly on the table and we have demanding objectives enshrined in the law in most areas. And this implies now that in the coming years, uh, we will need to um, a lot of resources and also uh, ambition for solid and determined implementation. And so obviously in doing that, um, but also in building further on, on these new um, priorities, um, also you as environmental NGOs, you will continue to play a, a key role in pushing environmental sustainability topics and in implementing the ambitious policy objectives. So. Um, Thank you. And with this, I will give over to, to I think, DG Klimar, and I will be present for any questions. Thank you very much, Clara. This was a very comprehensive and very clear presentation. I also love the, the visuals that you know, make it really clear what are the, the priorities. Um, I would like to, uh, yeah, we, I will soon pass the floor to uh, Stephanie. I would like to remind participants that if you have questions on the presentations now on the on the policy priorities, please keep them. Um, or you can already uh, uh, you can already put them in Slido. You can uh, already uh, send them uh, in Slido.com. Uh, hashtag EU Life 24, um, but we will reply to them at the time of question and answers, which will be uh, around 11.30. So please uh, uh, bear with us. And then uh, just, uh, sorry, uh, Stephanie, I would like to remind the participants that in case uh, they miss anything, uh, any presentation, uh, they shouldn't worry because they will find them on the live website and the platform of this event. And also all the recordings will be found on both websites and also on the YouTube live uh, channel uh, soon after the event as of next week. So uh, don't uh, you don't have to ask us where to find the slides. You will find them in the, in the relevant websites. So don't worry about that. I would like now to um, uh, call uh, Stephanie Hissinger, Head of Unit at uh, Directorate General for Climate Action in the European Commission. Uh, good morning, Stephanie, and welcome. She will uh, give, you, give us um, a presentation on the policy priorities from uh, DG Climate Action of the European Commission. Please, uh, Stephanie, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Indeed, I will uh, talk you through um, well what we achieved in recent years, but I can uh, be relatively brief on that and then give you a bit of an outlook as to what uh, is going to come uh, in the near future. If you move to the first slide. So I will not dwell on uh, the Green Deal and uh, its importance for climate policy. I think you are all very well acquainted with it, it uh, what the European Green Deal is, but then also that it laid, of course, the foundation for um, enshrining the climate neutrality target in the European climate law, the first ever European climate law that was uh, adopted, um, and also the uh, increased target of reaching at least 55% emissions by um, 2030, which was also put in the climate law together with uh, what we call the duty to adapt, so an enhanced uh, framework for adaptation. Uh, following, and you, I, I, I suppose you all are very much familiar with that, so following uh, the target setting through the European climate law we have adopted in the Commission the Fit for 55 package. And if you move to the next slide, then I give you still uh, an overview of uh, this package. Um, again, there, I don't think there's a need to go into the details. Uh, uh, most of these um, legislative acts uh, of this, uh, yeah, very comprehensive package uh, were adopted in the course of uh, 2023. 
uh, not least the revision of the effort sharing regulation of the EU emissions trading system and so on. There are uh, green deal files uh, that were still adopted in 2024, um, not least the emission performance standards uh, for cars and vans. Um, and uh, also really important uh, from a climate policy perspective, the regulation on fluorinated gases and the revision of the ozone regulation that were adopted in February this year. Um, so now I think on the climate uh, policy framework, we have uh, quite a complete picture. There are two acts uh, still outstanding um, at this point in time and waiting for the adoption in council is the EU uh, um, carbon removal certification framework on the one hand accounting for life cycle emissions of carbon removal activities uh, and that will set out also the rules for independent verification transparency and credibility of carbon removals and the second proposal that uh, uh, has been voted in the European Parliament but is and is uh, expected to be adopted soon is the review of the CO2 emission standards for heavy duty vehicles. Um, but for the rest, we have been moving since 2023 already to implementation of this uh, legislative package, which is now what we're doing with the, the adoption of a number of delegated and implementing acts. Um, and uh, yeah, putting uh, this legislation actually in, into practice. Uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, one topic that uh, is maybe not always so high on the radar of everyone is uh, are the national energy and climate plans, uh, where the draft uh, um, any updated NECPs were due by 30th of June, 2023. Um, 26 member states submitted their draft updated NDC, uh, NECPs, uh, but a majority of them with uh, significant uh, delays. Um, one member state uh, has not yet submitted the draft and uh, an infringement procedure has been opened uh, there. Um, what is maybe more important is uh, the assessment of the NECPs that were submitted uh, because they actually show um, that despite uh, substantial reductions in recent years, the emissions in 2020, 30, uh, 2030 excuse me, are estimated to be 51% lower than in 1990, which means that we would miss the minus 55% target set in the European climate law by four percentage points. Um, and that's why additional actions uh, are needed to uh, yeah, enable um, more stringent measures in, in the sectors uh, concerned. Um, in the assessment, or as an outcome of the assessment of the NECPs, 23 member states received recommendations related to public participation aspects and 23 member states received recommendations also related to regional cooperation. Um, if we move to the next slide, well, what uh, the, that's about the process uh, that is going to come. So right now, the assessment of the draft plans of Bulgaria and Poland um, is ongoing. And then um, we started an iterative uh, and political process with the member states, whereby technical meetings are taking place and uh, also member states visits by senior management of DG Ena and DG Klima, so technical work is ongoing and also engagement with uh, citizens and stakeholders and that's uh, still ongoing until June 2024 and should then lead by 30th of June 2024 so this year to the submission of the final updated NECPs uh, taking into account um, the commission's recommendations. So um, well the these activities uh, are really yeah, crucial to get to, to a really good out, outcome in relation to the NECPs. But uh, of course, uh, the NECPs are also not a fixed document. So member states will have to report on the progress. And uh, yeah, we will continue also the debate on implementation. So every two years we will get um, uh, reports and then uh, we can take also additional measures or recommend additional measures if needed. 
Um, if we move to the next slide, one important point in terms of climate policy was, of course, uh, um, on the 6th of February with the adoption of uh, the um, communication on uh, the 2040 climate target, with, which is an obligation also in the European climate law that the Commission uh, comes forward with um, uh, um, 2040 climate target. The Commission recommended a 90% net greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2040 uh, compared to 1990. Um, and uh, while the, the aim of this communication is mainly to launch a debate with stakeholders across the EU to feed into the process of agreeing then uh, the 2040 target in law, so in the European climate law, and then also preparing uh, the broad policy debate that is actually needed to uh, design the policy framework uh, post-2030. Um, the modeling results, um, and if we can move to the next slide in particular, also um, <clears throat> show us that uh, we will have to enhance some of the activities, uh, in particular when it comes to industrial carbon management. Uh, and that's why on the 6th of February as well, we have adopted uh, an industrial carbon management communication that sets out uh, yeah, the way how we uh, or should foster and and also how we we should actually um, yeah develop a policy framework for industrial carbon management so carbon capture and storage carbon capture and use and removals and also the necessary uh, infrastructure for uh, in particular carbon capture and storage uh, because the modeling results have shown us that we will. Uh, need to capture around 280 million tons by 2040 and going up to 450 million tons per year uh, of capture by 2050 and this needs uh, thorough preparation we have a number of capture uh, projects under the innovation fund uh, that we finance but uh, to date we do not have any operational co2 storage site in the eu we have them in the eea so norway but not in the EU, and that is where uh, we will uh, need to um, strengthen our our actions also at a policy level. Um, this, what I just said, is very closely related to the Net Zero Industry Act, whereby we, uh, which is not yet adopted, but should also um, yeah be adopted um, soon. There was a vote yesterday in the European Parliament. Um, but uh, the Net Zero Industry Act setting already a 50 million ton per year uh, target for CO2 injection capacity and an obligation for the oil and gas produ producers to provide for this uh, amount of um, injection capacity by 2030. I will not talk uh, about the Critical Raw Material Act as Clara has covered it. Uh, and then one very important uh, element um, on the industrial decarbonization side is uh, or are the all uh, are all the activities that we do under the innovation fund not least uh, under the European hydrogen bank whereby the innovation fund has financed uh, the first ever pilot auction with a budget of 800 million euros um, that auction has been launched or was launched on the 23rd of November last year. The bidding window closed in February and we will actually come forward uh, with the results of this pilot auction next week on Tuesday. Um, we received uh, for the auction quite a high number of bids, 132. Um, and uh, yeah, that uh, shows that there is competition out there for this kind of funding uh, and also um, that uh, the market, uh, the hydrogen market is actually ready for this kind of uh, support, which is covering, yeah, it's a fixed premium support, so covering the green premium that still exists um, when it comes to renewable hydrogen production. Um, finally, on the next slide, just a word also on, on adaptation. Um, also there, I, I don't think there's a need to go into um, the adaptation strategy and everything that's, that was adopted uh, since the adoption of the European Green Deal, but to highlight that um, in um, March, uh, 
the, the European Environmental Agency has published the first ever European climate risk assessment to help identify policy priorities for climate change adaptation and for climate sensitive sectors. And um, the, we have followed up as commission afterwards with publishing the communication on managing climate risks in Europe. And that um, communication st stresses in particular that policymakers can address the risks um, and uh, calls also on all levels of government as well as private sector and civil society to, to, to address uh, those risks. Uh, it sets out how the EU and the member states can anticipate, understand and address uh, growing climate risks. And also it encourages to prepare and implement policies uh, in that regard to effectively in the in the end uh, yeah save lives reduce costs but also safeguard the, the prosperity across the eu that is at threat because of uh, climate risks um it also enlightens the role of building and infrastructure standards uh, in integrating climate adaptation and resilience and confirms that uh, the eu is determined to to uh, um strengthen its actions also in, in this regard. Finally, um, first of all, thank you uh, for following this update this morning, but I also wanted to, to add a quick word on uh, the applications under this uh, call for proposals on which uh, Sinea colleagues will uh, afterwards elaborate uh, a bit more in detail. But I wanted from the commission side already make a remark on the work program that you have to add to your proposal. Uh, we know that the template is requiring quite some details from your side. However, um, based on experience that we have, we would uh, encourage you to focus on uh, in that work program on the broader activities that you want to implement rather than setting out your detailed positions on uh, certain subject matters that you deal with. Um, so the, the, the purpose of the work program is really to underline uh, that you will, uh, for example, advocate the position of your community, um, so the community you represent towards the EU institutions rather than set out in detail your position on a certain policy or um, your objective with regard to that policy. So uh, it's really a matter of um, yeah, referring in, in broad terms to the position uh, of the community you represent, uh, which will guide your work program rather than um, getting into uh, detailed, uh, uh, detailed actions that you will deploy uh, in that regard. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, speaking from experience where we would invite you uh, to focus yeah, on the broader activities that you plan to implement. So that's all from my side. Thanks uh, a lot. And my colleague Angelo will be available for answering questions uh, on what I said later on in the Q&A session. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Stephanie, for the very clear presentation. And also for reminding us that the NGO grants are indeed there to uh, allow the civil society to, uh, to voice their concerns and, uh, and to uh, put uh, forward their claims. And uh, in fact, that's, uh, that's very relevant to remind this. Uh, now, uh, I would like to uh, invite our third uh, speaker for, from the European Commission, Pierluca Merola from uh, Directorate General for Energy who will uh, present us the uh, policy updates and priorities from um, the, the, the point of view of uh, DG Energy. Uh, Pierluca, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you. Thank you very much also you know, from my side and welcome to, to the potential applicant uh, to, to this session. Also, I wish to thank as well the, the very good organization from CINEA and uh, the, the VO Europe for the overall uh, info days. Uh, so uh, going uh, directly to the energy policy update, uh, uh, as you know, many, many elements, uh, general uh, background elements also have been mentioned by, by the colleagues uh, of, um, of DG Clima. 
Roma in particular. Um, I will uh, uh, just start uh, by, by reminding uh, in, in general term the, the overall background and where we come from. As you know, in the current mandate of the Commission started with the European Green Deal and uh, with, uh, with the Fit for 55 package that was uh, the, an overall revision uh, of the um, of different file, including in particular for what concern uh, the energy transition, the key legislation, a youth legislative framework with regard to the energy transition. Um, these, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, this is particularly relevant to deliver on our climate objective as energy represent uh, um, still 70% uh, uh, of the overall, overall emissions are related to energy consumptions. Um, this uh, was complemented uh, during the, the current mandate as well from another uh, key pillar for the for the for our activity when I speak about the EU energy policy, which is the Repower EU plan. The Repower EU plan is in particular our plan to phase out the dependence on Russian fossil fuels, because developed after the unlawful aggression from Russia to Ukraine and the following energy crisis. Um, these, of course, uh, uh, pose in diff on different uh, uh, pillar. Uh, two of them are directly related to energy transition, namely to increase energy saving and energy efficiency overall, reducing our energy consumption and, of course, the, the emission related to it. And in the other side, to accelerate on the uh, on the deployment of, of renewables, but also on our clean energy transition uh, production of uh, uh, also of technology capacity. Now I will go uh, uh, a bit more in the in the detail. Uh, and we can move to the next slide, but I will start by, of course, uh, uh, mentioning uh, uh, how we are now arrived. Uh, we have the, uh, approved the key uh, legislative framework when it's come to energy transition at your level, the Energy Efficiency Directive, the Renewable Energy Directive, and the Energy Performance of Building Directive, as well as the Sustainable uh, Products uh, uh, Initiative and uh, with regard to eco-design and energy labeling. And now is the moment to uh, uh, focus on uh, transposition in member states, to ensure ambitious transposition transposition by member states, to deliver on this, uh, on this uh, directive, because in terms of implementation, the, uh, the objective set out are very are very are very ambitious as well as to uh, work uh, toward uh, activating the necessary additional tools uh, also in terms of financing to um, to be able to achieve our 2030 targets and next, uh, and after that uh, 20, the 2040 and 2050 uh, uh, climate neutrality overall objective so if i can go uh, directly indeed in the energy efficiency directive let me just uh, mention that this was uh, adopted uh, um, entering into force last october uh, after around two, two years of, 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 of interinstitutional negotiation, the overall uh, um, target was uh, was increased and also adjourned to the 2020 reference scenarios to a reduction in energy uh, consumption uh, by 11.7 percent. The target is binding at the at the EU level and uh, uh, with national with national contribution. This uh, is quite uh, uh, here, of course, uh, the, the overall energy efficiency framework is a, is a, is a, is fundamental for the cost effective uh, decarbonization, as you know, and as well looking to our 2040 in the in the communication, you will see that uh, uh, um, the reduction of energy consumption will need to continue also after that. So it will give us uh, really the, the new framework to to move toward the, toward toward the long term objective. If I um, can mention a couple of key elements in this regard, one of course is uh, the um, key measure to deliver on on uh, on uh, on uh, on this that will need to be transposed. In particular, the national energy savings obligation that have been increased according to a stepwise approach to 1.49% in average, starting from 0.8 in 2024, 2024 arriving then to 2028, 1.9%. If we can move to the next slide, please. I would like to enter a bit into the detail of the uh, so-called uh, just transition sub-target. In this case, uh, it's important to mention, I think, in this framework, because it's also, I think, close to the to the activity of the civil society organization. Because what uh, was uh, new also in the energy efficiency target here, I'm speaking about the, the annual energy saving obligation, is that uh, the new legislation set out a just transition sub-target where uh, the, um, the energy saving are required to be achieved uh, uh, among uh, uh, vulnerable customer on energy poor or uh, in worst performing building. This is important because it's key that uh, uh, the um, that uh, uh, mainly uh, the 
uh, the benefit of the energy transition arrive uh, uh, to all uh, uh, citizens and to all uh, part of the population, and in particular that uh, we focus in uh, activating uh, investment and activating actions uh, uh, to ensure that no one is left uh, is left behind. That uh, the, the the overall energy transition can benefit uh, all, all all sectors of the of the society. If we can move to the next uh, slide, I think uh, I will uh, inter I will mention briefly as well uh, the overall renewable energy directive and related target as you know renewables are the key uh, um, the key technology that we need to decarbonize our energy our energy system uh, compared to the um, Compared to the previous uh, uh, to the president uh, framework, uh, the uh, renewable target was was doubled in the final adopted uh, directive. Here as well, the directive entered into force in November 2023, and now there is the two-year transposition pe period by member state. And uh, um, this is composed as well uh, uh, compared to the initial commission proposal, as mentioned, the fact that we had the recovery plan and this entail a, a revision during the negotiation is uh, foresee that basically we have an, a, a higher final target than the original commission proposal of 42.5% of share of renewable in the energy system by 2030, which is uh, a very an ambitious target and is, is close as well. So it's where why uh, um, the delivery and the, and the implementation are particularly key in this period. Uh, here, uh, I will not enter into detail, but there are also a mix of uh, sectorial uh, and target made both on an annual base, a mandatory or indicative. I think the most relevant one is on heating and cooling. As you know, on heating and cooling and uh, the, the, cons the energy consumption in particular on, on, on building uh, is indeed the key to move toward uh, uh, renewable based type of generation, electrification as well. And that is why there is a man mandatory annual increase of 1.1% in uh, the renewable energy source share in uh, when it comes to heating, uh, heating and cooling. Link. If uh, uh, we can move to the next slide, I would like to also enter very briefly into the topic of permitting. Here, uh, I wanted just to recall what is very important also across the different policy areas covered by life set uh, by life, pardon, uh, and in particular the environmental one uh, when it's come to the um, the, sustain the sustainability criteria uh, when it's come to renewable deployment. They have been strengthened across the board also to uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, negative impact on the environment uh, in, when it comes to um, risk of production from food uh, uh, feedstock. Uh, Etc. And it's very important when when looking at the transposition, etc. These are are indeed uh, uh, importantly covered to avoid uh, to avoid this possible negative impact. If we can move to the next slide, I will uh, mention also uh, the a key area that and a key development when it comes to the renewable energy directive, which is the uh, designation and uh, of renewable as uh, a deployment as overriding public interest and the designation the need to identify renewable acceleration areas where permitting procedures procedures are simplified, are accelerated, and in order for us to deliver on the on the on the 2030 targets that when it comes to, to renewables. If we can move to the next slide, please. In this regard, in particular, uh, there are there are clear indication uh, in the in the directive for the transposition and uh, for the implementation. In particular, to have short deadline for a number of uh, of uh, of uh, ob obligation in terms of uh, of um, of authorization at member state level, including, for instance, the environmental impact assessment, etc. Here is is really key that uh, this type of uh, of uh, acceleration in terms of permitting procedures is indeed uh, uh, correctly transposed and, and more monitored. If we can move to, to the next slide. Uh, the three uh, the third uh, key legislation and the most recent in terms of approval is the energy performance of building directive. As you know, buildings are uh, uh, responsible for uh, uh, the close to the 40% of our, our energy consumption happening in buildings and something similar when it comes to the uh, greenhouse gas, gas emissions are related to, to buildings. Um, so the, the overall EPBD, the Energy Performance on Building Directive, was uh, now uh, adopted uh, by the Council uh, after the vote in the Parliament, of course, in the 12th of April. So we are we are finally there with uh, with uh, uh, finalized the negotiation uh, in, on this landmark directive, and is divided on twofold objective, both very relevant. On one side, on a short to medium term, uh, a new instrument have been deployed to activate, increase the renovation rates across Europe in order to um to 
let's say, attack that potential that is in terms of energy savings in building. And on the other side, the, the overall decarbonization of the building sector with, uh, with a view to uh, have uh, uh, prepared the build environment to the 2050 climate neutrality, in particular when it comes to the introduction of the standard of zero emission buildings for new build, or as well uh, when it comes to the uh, life cycle assessment, uh, including uh, when it comes to the construction material and the overall construction sector. If we can move to the to whole life cycle carbon. If we can move to the next slide, I would like, uh, and here I could ask the organization to advance because I know that having it presented it, um, yes, so that the image up here, please. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, press again <laughs> and again. Thank you. I'm sorry for that, but indeed this uh, is, is how it is organized. Here is the key um, provisions when it comes to buildings and when it comes to activating the, uh, 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 when it comes to increasing the renovation rates across building the regulatory provision with the introduction of minimum energy performance standards for the national, uh, the non-residential building stock and uh, of national trajectory that member state will need to define according to a number of criteria set in the in the EU, in the directive, in the EU legal act, in order to trigger uh, energy saving in worst performing building and really to go and concentrate actions toward the worst performing building, the one that really need to be uh, to be uh, to be renovated and where we need to to save to save energy. If we can move uh, uh, to the next slide, um, I want to briefly also recall the very important framework with the, now with the, with the. SPI, the Sustainable Product Initiative, and the overall framework of the Econ Design and Energy Labeling. This, as you know, is a, a, an extremely relevant framework, not only to uh, phase out uh, non-performing products uh, and to um, uh, have, indeed, more uh, efficient uh, products, but also to be monitored uh, by, um, by consumer organizations, by NGOs, by the civil society organizations. Uh, it's, these are primarily uh, a, a service, of course, to, to consumer and uh, in particular when we speak about energy labeling and uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, the, the, the 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 as you know as those of you that know indeed the, the overall framework is here is established by uh, a general act and then a number of delegating and implementing act for type of products where it's important to to balance the instance that come from the industry with the with consumer protection in this regard and where also the civil society is particularly relevant if we can move to the to the next uh, last slide that I think Think it's final just to 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 recall uh, the, um, the overall uh, indeed to conclude on this um the uh, uh, as you as I said on the beginning, we are at the at the end of the current Commission uh, mandate, just before the European elections. We have uh, uh, came here with the um, we have approved now an ambitious uh, Fit for 55 package and a power plan that need to where we need now to uh, deliver and, and and implement it, uh, and it will be key in the next in the next uh, um, in the next year. Uh, to uh, support uh, uh, the, um, the implementation, to monitor the transposition, because we are in the period of the uh, transposition in member state of the directive in, in, that will happen between end of 2025 and early 2026, where many of the instruments that have been negotiated at your level need to enter and will be defined at national level with uh, uh, by and need to we need to ensure that this have uh, ensured the, the relevant level of ambition. Also, there is a key element that when I mentioned in with regard to just transition to assist and accompany and engage with citizen and consumer in the energy transition uh, to uh, ensure that no one is left behind, that the transition is not the is not negatively uh, affected or uh, uh, can receive a, a negatively perception by the, the overall the overall community. And finally, the focus on the mobilization, of course, of investment and financing to achieve our, our objective. With that, uh, I uh, conclude and uh, uh, I thank you very much for your attention, for attending, and I uh, look forward also uh, together with uh, with the expert evaluator and senior colleagues to, to, to see many of your applications. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierluca, for setting the scene on the energy uh, uh, perspective. Um, I, I hope that uh, our NGOs will be uh, a lot to uh, apply also uh, with a lot of uh, contributions to the energy policy. I think that Clara uh, wanted to add something. Please, Clara, uh, go on. Yes. 
thank you for giving me back the floor one more time. I have just a small um, um, remark. So um, just for your information, there is currently an update ongoing on the financial regulation. So as you know, this is um, like the basic text uh, guiding all the financial procedures of the um, of the EU. Um, and the so um, the, in December, there was an agreement of council and parliament. Uh, but um, the final um, vote is expected in autumn this year, and we also expect it to um, enter into force in early autumn this year. And for you to know, there will be now an addition of a definition of non-governmental organizations. Um, this, um, yeah, and also in the future, applicants will for grants will have to submit a decl declaration on their legal status, including whether they are NGOs. But this will not yet be applied for this call. Um, but it's already an information for you to, to know in the future. And um, the definition of non-governmental NGOs is a voluntary independent from government non-profit organization, which is not a political party or a trade union. So this is for your background for the future already to be, to be aware of this. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Clara, for uh, this uh, very useful information. Um, I think that we now have uh, the coffee break. Uh, just like to uh, remind our participants that uh, they can post their questions in Slido and we will come back for a question and answer session at 11. Uh, so it's planned between 11 and uh, 11.30. And then um, we will uh, first have a, a presentation just after the coffee break uh, at uh, uh, quarter past 10. We will uh, come back and uh, we will give you a presentation on the application uh, process and uh, the uh, selection and evaluation procedure. So please uh, make sure that you are back uh, in uh, 12 minutes. See you soon. Bye.